What's up everybody? It's your boy J.A. Brown. So I got something for you today that's... Oh boy. I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time. At least a year, I think. And uh, every time I think it's not relevant anymore because it's too long ago, it just keeps popping right back into relevance. It is truly the gift that keeps on giving. So what I'm talking about is this. I just saw this on Twitter a few days ago. Jonathan Yaniv's bathroom harassment claim dropped by BC prosecutors. Oh boy, looks like Jonathan Yaniv was at it again with a brand new human rights claim. What happened this time was apparently that he charged a woman named Amy Ham with sexual harassment for allegedly taking pictures of him in the women's washroom at the Surrey courthouse. So, I figured this would be a, a good opportunity to make this video and tell you how the original human rights claims and the entire shitstorm that ensued. To be honest, I've, I've lost count of how many legal proceedings this person has been embroiled in by now. But I wanted to tell you how that, in my opinion, completely vindicates Jordan Peterson's opposition to Bill C-16 back in 2016. Yes, that's right. When Jordan Peterson originally criticized Bill C-16, he was warning us. He foresaw that this exact kind of shit would happen as a result of the bill being signed into law. Now, let me explain. Oh, and by the way, if you're new to this whole issue, which honestly I can't really imagine if you're the kind of person who follows me on social media, don't worry about that, it will all become clear. Okay, so let's go back to the time when Jordan Peterson originally formulated his criticism of Bill C-16. He made a series of videos titled Professor Against Political Correctness. That was in September 2016, by the way, that's almost four years ago now. It's crazy when you think about it, how fast time passes. Anyway, in the first of these videos, he outlines what Bill C-16 is and what he thinks the consequences of it will be. And he also outlines his opposition against hate speech legislation in general. Let's hear it from him. Ontario, and I'm going to concentrate on Ontario because I think a lot of this is emanating from a small coterie of people behind the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which is a particularly pathological organization in my estimation and perhaps the biggest enemy of freedom currently extant in Canada. And I don't say that lightly. So... The reason I think the Ontario Human Rights Commission is, is an emblematic institution in this regard is partly because I think that, the, that social justice warrior type activists are overrepresented in the current um, provincial government fed, or the current liberal provincial government. And I can't help but shake this, I can't help but manifest the suspicion that that's partly because our current um, premier is lesbian in her sexual preference and that in and itself doesn't bother me one way or another. I don't think it's relevant to the political discussion except insofar as the LBGT community has become extraordinarily good at organizing themselves and has a fairly pronounced and very, very sophisticated radical fringe and I can't help but see the hand of that in what I'm going to read to you and you can make up your own mind and see if you think the same thing. So the wording on the Ontario Human Rights Commission with regards to legislation like Bill C-16 is the same. It's identical to that on the Canadian Department of Justice. I, I've given you the links here. And so that's another indication to me that there's tremendous crosstalk between these institutions, one at the provincial level, that's the Ontario one, and one at the federal level, because the wording is identical. So that's the argument for overlap. And the other thing too, with regards to the LBGT angle on this, is that the wording is identical in many regards to that that's commonly used by LBGT activists. And so that's why I'm putting the different organizations together. Because of the legislation, it, it's possible, I believe it's possible, that my commentary on these definitions is now illegal and that it's also now potentially classifiable as hate speech. And I would say, if that's the case, then, like, well, it's the sort of thing I'm going to question and if, 
someone should be put in jail for questioning that and then I questioning that <clears throat> then I guess I should be put in jail because I'm going to continue to question it I think it's nonsensical I think the formulation is absurd I think it has no scientific standing I think it's ideologically motivated I think it's divisive I think it's dangerous it causes chaos it confuses people there's no upside to it and for any for every one person that this potential transformation of legislation is going to free from oppression it's going to deathly confuse a hundred more well this is also Ontario Human Rights Commission policy okay so this is the scenario I've been running through my head I can envision a student or a colleague insisting that I call, call them using gender neutral pronouns G Z H E or Z H E for you Americans G or Zur I think it is I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I think it's manipulative. I, I and I don't I don't um I don't recognize another person's right to determine what pronouns I use to address them. I won't do it. Now again, I think that uh, because of these new laws, the and, and, and that 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 my decision might be illegal and maybe it's even a decision of hate. But I'm not doing it. I think that those gender neutral pronouns are politically motivated. I think they're connected to an entire underground apparatus of political motivations, radical left political motivations. And I think uttering those words makes me a tool of those motivations. And I'm going to try to be a tool of my own motivations as clearly as I can articulate them and not the mouthpiece of some murderous ideology. So he points out that the bill is poorly worded and that it will not have the intended effect, or the claimed intended effect, of simply adding transgender people to the list of protected categories. Note, by the way, that Peterson, in this video, points out the influence of social justice warrior activists in the Ontario provincial government, and that he says the Ontario provincial government likely had a strong influence on the wording of this bill. This is highly relevant, as we shall see. Now, in the Canadian Senate hearing on Bill C-16, Peterson again explained how incoherent the wording of the bill is and the potential dangers that it opens up. For example, he says that gender identity and gender expression are not even properly or coherently defined in the legislation. One of the reasons I criticized this to begin with was because when I went through the policies, I could see that they're absolutely incoherent. So, for example, here, let me give you another example. So there's an insistence in the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual preference is an immutable phenomena, which indicates, at least in principle, that it's biologically grounded. But on the same, by the same token, in exactly the same policies, they presume that sexual identity, gender identity, and gender expression are entirely independent. It's like, sorry, guys, you can't have both of those because one's A and one's not A, and you can't put those together. And, like, there's... there's Endless numbers of places in the policy uh, surround, surrounding Bill C-16 that are characterized by that kind of logical incoherency. And I mean, what's it going to do to people who are transgender, who are making the claim that they were, say, born that way at birth, which is a strong claim. That's a biological claim. It indicates that there's a direct causal connection between some biological phenomena and the expression of a particular identity. It's actually the strongest defense that people who have, let's call them non-standard sexual identities or gender identities, have to defend their okay. claims. Despite this and the expert witness testimony of others, such as Gad Saad, the Canadian Senate went right ahead and signed a bill into law anyway. Soon after that, some very disingenuous individuals started writing about how Peterson misunderstands the bill and the effect it will have. And the argument is always roughly the same, namely that Bill C-16 won't make it illegal to refuse to use people's desired pronouns, you won't go to jail for not using them, because that's not what the bill literally says. Here you can see what it says. For example, uh, Branda Cosman, who is a professor of law at University of Toronto, has said this, and also the Canadian Bar Association has said it, but all these people are missing the point. See, Peterson did not say that this will happen necessarily. He was worried that it could happen. He was warning against the possible consequence of this legislation. Now, even under the part of the bill that applies only to the Canadian Human Rights Act, not to the Criminal Code, 
Even if you violate that, you might be fined or you might be ordered to follow corrective training, which, to be honest, I think is a, a terrible thing in itself. But what happens if you refuse to pay the fine? Or what happens if you refuse to attend the training? Nobody has ever said anything about that. Also, believe me, there are definitely people who believe that using the wrong pronouns to refer to people should be a criminal offense. And they will try to get the law interpreted that way. And that was Peterson's point. It was about the bill itself and the whole framework of policies and legislation surrounding it. All of this stuff is so poorly written that it's open to many different kinds of interpretation. It is not necessarily going to be interpreted as intended or as it is claimed to be intended. Besides, just because the Canadian Bar Association says something doesn't necessarily mean it's true. In 2013, a part of the Canadian Human Rights Act called Section 13 was repealed that made it illegal to communicate hate messages by telephone or on the internet. Now, this Section 13 was so poorly written, for example, it wasn't defined what exactly constituted hate messages, that allowed it to be exploited against free speech, that is, to be used to censor speech on ideological grounds. And that's why it is a good thing that it was repealed. Yet, in this article, you can read that the Canadian Bar Association claimed this was a terrible thing for human rights and that it would lead to the proliferation of so-called hate speech, whatever that is. So I suspect that the Canadian Bar Association is also within the uh, sphere of influence of these left-wing social justice activist types. I mean, you can't just, you, you can't take anything these organizations say at face value because it is very likely to be politically motivated. Anyway, this argument that Bill C-16 does not lead to compelled speech, that it won't be illegal to not use these pronouns, and that it will not legally require us to act as if we believe fictional claims about sex and gender, that all of that is not true, that argument is false. These people are wrong. And the Jessica Yaniv affair proves it. This is Jessica Yaniv, also known as Jonathan Yaniv. He claims to be a transsexual woman and in 2018 he filed 16 human rights complaints against beauty salon owners in Canada for refusing services, in particular for refusing to wax his penis and testicles. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will be familiar with this affair by now. The legal provision by which he filed these human rights claims was, as you might have guessed, the Canadian Human Rights Act, which by now had been amended by Bill C-16 to include the wording about gender identity and gender expression. So he filed human rights claims against these beauty salon owners, he, discrimination claims. And then the case dragged on and on until October 2019, when the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal finally ruled against Geneve and in favor of the beauty salon owners. In the meantime, some of these salon owners, most of whom are immigrant women from a poor background, paid so much money to settle the case that they ended up going out of business, as you can see in this article. Of course, we now know that later on the whole affair got even more weird when Yaniv later filed more discrimination suits against beauty salons, this time for not waxing his legs, and was himself the suspect in criminal proceedings as a result of this video in which Blair White tricks him into displaying illegal weapons on camera. I still don't know how that ended, by the way. And that's apart from being a giant creep in general. And now we've just seen the news that he filed a claim against Amy Hamm for allegedly taking his picture in a public washroom. Fortunately, that claim was dropped as well. But as you can see, the whole train wreck just keeps going on and on and on. And Jordan Peterson warned us against this exact kind of shit happening back in 2016. Or, as I like to put it, JBP BEEN warned y'all! Now you might object and say that, well, since Yaniv lost the case, in fact, he has not won any of his cases, then what's the problem, right? Doesn't this prove that Peterson was in fact wrong about Bill C-16? That you are not forced to pretend by law that sex does not physiologically exist or that it is irrelevant? 
But that too, I think, would be beside the point and disingenuous as well. See, the whole the whole fact that it is possible to sue beauty salon owners for refusing to wax male genitalia just because the person with the male genitalia identifies as a woman, the fact that this human rights claim was not dismissed out of hand as nonsense, that in itself is a consequence of Bill C-16. It's a consequence of Bill C-16 and the policies surrounding it, both on a national level and a provincial level, in Ontario, in British Columbia and other provinces. And for the women who went out of business as a result of all this, the damage is already done. It doesn't matter that they ended up winning the case. And this is all the result of the kind of ideological thinking that Peterson warned us about. Okay, so in this case, the judges ruled against Geneve. But if you followed the case, you would have seen that it was very close. It was hotly contested. What if Geneve would have won? I dread to think about that. And let's not forget that it's not over yet, because this latest claim, the one from January 2020, is still under consideration as we speak. What happens if Geneve wins that one? What if the court orders that a female beautician is legally required to wax the legs of a male client? Something that involves near nudity and contact with the skin in the region right next to the genital region. Now, I'm sure that in a world where Bill C-16 had never happened, this would be a lot harder. These claims would be a lot less likely to even be considered in the first place. Even so, you might say, okay, that applies to the part of Bill C-16 that's about the Canadian Human Rights Act. But what about the other part, the part that's about the, the Canadian Criminal Code? Isn't Peterson wrong about that? After all, a human rights claim falls under civil law, not criminal law. There's no danger of being charged with a criminal offense for refusing to use a person's desired pronouns or refusing to provide certain services based on their sex. Well, apart from the point I made above, what happens if you lose a civil case and then refuse to pay the fine or whatever? It is true that this does not constitute a hate crime as defined by the Canadian Criminal Code. However, it's not the case that Bill C-16 has had no effect on what constitutes so-called hate speech. The part in the Canadian Human Rights Act does, in fact, make it illegal, although not a criminal offense, but still illegal to publicly deny the politically correct ideas about gender and sex that are now enshrined in law. Case in point, there was this guy named Bill Watcott. In 2017, he made these flyers about Morgan Auger, a male to female transgender candidate for parliament at the time, in which he basically states that Morgan Auger is a man, that transgender women are male, and in which he criticizes Auger's policies. He then spread these flyers in public, and in April 2019, he was found guilty of discrimination, hatred, and contempt, and fined $55,000. Yes, it was a civil case, not a criminal case. No, he was not convicted of a hate crime, and no, he was not sent to prison, but nonetheless, none the bloody less, in Canada, you can now be ordered by a human rights tribunal to pay 55,000 Canadian dollars for saying that a trans woman is a man. That's dangerously close, as far as I'm concerned, to being thrown in prison. I might actually make a video on this particular case, because I think it's interesting enough to merit a whole video of its own. So, all the people who are saying that Jordan Peterson was wrong because the new law does not literally state that you will be a criminal offender for refusing to use someone's preferred pronouns, these people may be technically correct, but they are painfully missing the point in a dangerous way, and I think it's disingenuous as well. Well, it's either disingenuous or extremely naive. I can't tell which one of those is worse, but either way, I think it's dangerous. This is not the kind of society that I want to live in. And I think it's not the, the society that we should live in. And this is just in Canada, but it can spread to other countries as well. And it's going to spread if nobody stops it. All right, everyone, that's been what I wanted to say on that topic. Uh, now, before I finish the video, I just wanted to say a couple more little things. Uh, as for myself, I'm doing okay. I was out of the loop for a while because I was working on my MA thesis. I recently graduated. I think I'm pretty much back on top of things now. Uh, so I should have more time to make videos. 
Um, also, this is important. I am now on Locals, which is Dave Rubin's new alternative to Patreon. It's a site where you can support creators just like Patreon, but the difference is that Locals doesn't ban creators for exercising their right to free speech if they don't like it. So if you want me to be able to afford the equipment I need to make better videos, like an actual studio, for example, or if you want me to have more time to work on videos like this one, go to Locals, become my supporter on there, and give me money. Now, I also wanted to say something about Jordan Peterson. It was his birthday last week, he turned 58, I think, and his daughter Michaela posted this picture of them together in a restaurant in Serbia, where he is apparently undergoing treatment at the moment. I also found out that a while ago Michaela posted this video of Jordan playing with a radio-controlled car. So it looks like he can stand up and walk by himself, that is really good news. Uh, his fine motor skills also seem normal in this video. That's really good because, man, that guy has been through a lot and he was doing really badly. So I'm very happy to see that he appears to be recovering so well. But I was even more excited about another thing Michaela said, which was that Jordan is going to say something on video soon. Uh, she said that would happen within the next 10 days. And that was maybe four or five days ago. So hopefully that means we will hear Jordan Peterson speak again very soon. I'm really excited and looking forward to that. Anyway, that's it for me for now. Follow me on Twitter, support me on Locals, check out my website, jbrownswebsite.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Hit that bell! See you!